quite early, yes. Good morning again, speaking closer to the microphone. Even closer to the microphone. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out uh, early on this last day of the IGF. My name is, is David Wood, if we haven't met, and I work in emerging media. It's a lot better than working in declining media, you must admit. Uh, and uh, I, I work with the uh, World Broadcasting Unions, which is the assembly of uh, the world's eight broadcasting unions. So pretty much we, uh, we're responsible for all the bad things in broadcasting in the world. Uh, and our session today is a combination of two workshops. Uh, essentially, one which was concerned with, uh, I think you'd summarize it by saying identity management, and a second one concerned with the particular problems that uh, we should consider uh, for, for children. So what we've done is to put them together. So we have a workshop which is about identity management, but we hope our panelists will make a reference where it's appropriate to the particular sensitivities of children. So that's our plan. We have a kind of two-part session for you this morning. The first one will look at uh, this issue of identity management. What is the current situation? What's the scope of the issue? What's the, what's the problem? And, uh, and then we'll go on in the second part to look at uh, options for public policy. And we, uh, in, in that, session. We look at legal perspectives. We have a case study, some reactions to it, uh, some um, interesting work that's already been done, and something about uh, mediation mechanisms. One of our panelists uh, wasn't able to catch the bus this morning, so she'll probably walk in in the session. But uh, apart from that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's begin with our, our scene setting part of this workshop. And we uh, turn, first of all, to uh, Thomas Schneider, who's with uh, the the uh, go government agency Ofcom in Switzerland and he's going to give you a summary of, of his views and those of some colleagues who have been working in this area in the Council of Europe. So let me ask Thomas Snyder and he can speak from where he sits if he wishes to take you through uh, this first preparatory part. Thomas. Aha, okay. Ah, that looks nice. It just work. Um, actually, it's 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 uh, what I'm going to present to you is is a little bit less my points of view. Uh, I work for the Swiss regulator for electronic media and uh, for the telecom market, which is Ofcom, not the UK one, but the Swiss one. Um, we were there first. Um, but I'm going to present to you uh, 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 in, in try to be short. Uh, some of the input that two of the experts that uh, work, uh, researchers that work for the Council of Europe would have uh, been uh, making if they would have been here. Um, you know the reasons why uh, Council of Europe uh, decided to cancel um, its participation, but they are still very uh, interested in, in, in feeding in their input to the, to the to the discussion. So the first input is by uh, Ms. Andrea Milwood Hargrave. She's a, a researcher and professor uh, from London uh, that works uh, very uh, much on, on uh, uh, child protection and also on empowerment of children, and, 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 but not only children in the online environment. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to read a few, a few statements of hers that <coughs> might incite the discussion. <coughs> um, the risk of harm through content is not new to the internet, but the widespread accessibility along with its affordability, anonymity and convenience is seen by many to increase the likelihood of media harm and offence. <clears throat> A simple search may bring specialist content to anyone, often by mistake. Other than access to possibly harmful content in the traditional media, which is normally regulated by national law, the internet does not respect these national borders. Adult access to potentially harmful content can be harmful for vulnerable groups. For example, online pornography uh, to sexually uh, compulsive people or to sexual abusers. For children, there is a risk of de-stress when they accidentally come across unwelcome content online like pornography or violence. 
there is not only risk of harm through content, but even more through contact and interaction with other users. <coughs> Such contact may put users at a risk of harm, either directly, as in meeting strangers in dangerous situations, or indirectly from the consequences of their online behavior. This includes everything from the school or workplace bully to the grooming of children by pedophiles. It has become <clears throat> evident that many children and adults experience some risky contact. Further research shows that when people, adults and children, receive hostile bullying or hateful messages, they are generally ill-equipped to respond appropriately or to cope with the emotional upset uh, this causes. The consequence of exposure seems to be more harmful for those who are already vulnerable. That means if you are based on a very sane environment in a good family and you're good educated that you're less uh, opposed to, to the risk of harm is, is much less than those people who are at the edge of society and already uh, more vulnerable. For social networking especially, the issue of verifiability and anonymity is a problem. A significant proportion of young people communicates with strangers online and post material about themselves which could be considered private in most circumstances. The ability to restrict access to sites is known about but not always used. Thus, knowingly, some young people give away inappropriate private information publicly, allowing access to anyone. However, it seems likely that many more also do so inadvertently as a result of limitations both in internet literacy but also in inter interface design. This leads to concern about the possibility of underestimating the un un unanticipated or future consequences of making private information public, especially since it appears that many young people have an inadequate understanding of the long-term consequences of publishing such information. We all probably know about the cases of, of young people who did not get the jobs they were applying to because their, their, uh, the, the HR people were, were HR people of the companies were Googling and finding some information on them on the internet <clears throat> uh, that they were not supposed to find. Research suggests young people may be aware of the risks, especially regarding social networking sites, but this awareness uh, of these issues and problems is not always translated into action. Thus, there is growing evidence that notwithstanding their many advantages and pleasures, social networking sites permit young people to create profiles <coughs> that expose the individual or that ridic ridicule or harass others, that using such sites for extensive period of time, as it is common, may isolate users of these sites from contact with real people, with, with analog people in the analog world, albeit on for a few addicted users. <clears throat> Uh, I would stop here with this first uh, 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 input and would directly go to the second one, if you allow me, which is from a uh, a French uh, <coughs> professor at the Nouvelle Sorbonne, Miss Divina Frau Meeks, and which is uh, uh, also uh, there f to give you input, and uh, it's, it, it contains some provocative statements, and we are interesting to, to, to see the reaction and have the discussion. <coughs> um, <coughs> I just kind of make a few bullet points because she sent me quite a lot of pages of information and I had to somehow condense it to make it presentable. <clears throat> one, point that she, one point that she claims is that often businesses do not take up their responsibilities. So they offer tools and services that are not secure or where private settings are not in favor of the users. So it is up to the user to, to protect himself uh, <clears throat> and uh, the responsibility should be put on the service providers that at least they help the users to, to, to uh, better protect themselves or they provide different default settings where the user from the start is, is better protected. Anonymity, of course, is also an issue <coughs> in the online world. <coughs> There, there is a distinction between people that, people that think that they are anonymous in the online world uh, <coughs> as regards to their identity in the offline world, but this anonymity is not always uh, uh, a real anonymity, but sometimes uh, people know very well who is behind an avatar. Stereotypes in the online world uh, is, is, is something that is, is seen very often in games and so on. Avatars of men or women uh, normally look like uh, Angelina Jolie and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, no avatar of, there are no ugly women in, in online games, for instance, or no small men in online games. So this uh, uh, is, 
is creating a problem and, and the distinction between the online and offline reality that can cause problems especially to, to young people and, and their identity uh, developing process. <clears throat> um, she also claims that um, there are uh, uh, some problematic uh, uh, relations between the users and the so-called cultural industries. <clears throat> and, and, and there is a risk of exploitation of the work and knowledge of users on user-generated uh, 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 content and social networking sites platforms. And uh, <clears throat> to, to, to provocate the discussion, I, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, she says that creative industries can become a risk for independent, non-proprietary identity activities and, and services and that there is a problem with publicity and the border with advertising and one-to-one -one marketing, especially concerning young people. Neuromarketing and manipulation of mental processes uh, are uh, challenging things. There is also a problem, or can be problems with identity and dignity infringements on, 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 on such sites. Um, and it can be a problem especially for young people if they are denied uh, the right to participate in their favorite forum or in, in, in the forum that all their friends are and so on. And that we should find ways of protecting the integrity of an identity as part of the dignity of human rights. <coughs> She offers, uh, she proposes a few solutions. One solution is literacy and empowerment with regard to uh, the management uh, of a person's identity, of a person's online identity. And one tool is the creation of a need portfolio where you produce a, a chosen positive online identity that you can use here or there in, in different, different uh, uh, aspects of your identity. She proposes to create testing fields for online identity. Uh, and, and, and there is an example which is called ePortfolio.org, which is a student-centered platform where people can play with, with these identities. <clears throat> and also it has to be made sure that individuals have a responsible approach to their cybercrime activities with full awareness uh, of fallout in real space activities. Um, Another possible solution is, is, is the, 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 to use the public service on the internet. She promotes uh, non-commercial spaces where positive ideas, uh, identities can thrive. An example is the BBC's Creative Archive project that allows modification of digital clips of BB, uh, BBC TV and uh, is an example for a new role for public service media that helps in empowering uh, people, especially young people but also uh, adults, on identity building and on identity management. So public service, she also claims that public service and open source can be a fruitful combination. There are similar initiatives in Japan, in Canada and in France as well. And she claims there should also be public service obligations for private sector services uh, depending on the impact they have on, on, on the public life. And um, she also refers to a regulatory model which is similar to the public forum model. Public forum model is, is something that, uh, that uh, came out in, 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 in around the Electronic, uh, uh, front, uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, uh, can't, that kind, not able to tell you the right word now. Electronic Frontier Foundation, I think it's true. Um, <clears throat> and Richard Stallman. And uh, this is also a kind of open source uh, as a means to empower people that instead of just consuming, the users themselves use and reuse content and cre uh, in a creative and empowering way and, and th that should enable users to adapt services to their personal needs themselves rather than depend on, on the services the way they are. Um, these are the, this is the input by, by uh, two researchers and experts uh, from London and Paris. Thank you. You've heard the uh, first presentation and the, the notes that I made, we had from the perspective from, uh, from Andrea that, uh, about harm through internet, if you like, and, and in particular the case of children, the risks being stressed, meeting and interacting physically with people, um, that the vulnerable are the most susceptible to... Uh, uh, to the instability of it, I suppose, and uh, there are other harmful areas such as using Google uh, to find information about people which can be used against them in their search for employment. From Davina, uh, we uh, heard about the particular issue of, uh, of anonymity and the area of uh, avatars and things like stereotyping and so on that it can cause. Um, 
and that also the creative industries uh, can uh, become a negative uh, factor for young people uh, in different ways. But there are solutions, uh, the e-portfolio and indeed the media with things like the BBC's creative archive can uh, actually have a positive uh, effect. Now, let's. Uh, this is what I've waited to do all my life. I could say, well, let's turn to the oracle, and um, let me invite Joseph uh, Alderdef uh, from Oracle uh, to set the scene and tell you about the issues as he sees them. Joseph, thank you. Well, um, when, when we look at identity management, things have gotten more complex because we no longer live in a situation where a person interacts with just a company. A person often interacts with a family of companies or a network of companies that are usually used to engage in a transaction. Uh, they deal with large networks of people, possibly on social networks, but also in their normal interactions. So now we really are looking at an ecosystem model rather than a one-to-one -one model, which used to exist. And I'm going to look at two uh, organizations that are doing work uh, in this and describe a little bit of what they're doing because I think it's an informative way of looking at these models that are also privacy respectful and user centric. Uh, the Liberty Alliance is a, an organization that comprises a number of companies and, organ and, uh, and organizations, so it's not just for-profit companies, that are working together to develop uh, concepts related to federation. Federation really is looking at the ideas that we operate within communities. Uh, the term in liberty they use is circles of trust. And then you're going to have interacting circles of trust. A and part of the idea is how you manage a system where you can have appropriate controls yet still enable the, the flow of information that's necessary uh, as needed to either accomplish transactions or, or facilitate communication. The other group I'm going to talk about is something we participate in called the Trusted Architecture for Securely Shared Services, or TAS-3. Uh, TAS-3 is a European-funded uh, research project that is essentially looking at e-health and uh, e-employment portfolios and looking at how to do, deal with them in a user-controlled uh, setting. Um, one of the things I want to get to when we look at federation is because we're looking at an ecosystem, one of the things that Liberty has looked at is that you have to think about federation and identity management at a technology level, a policies level, and actually a legal level as well. Because you need to have binding across the obligations, otherwise the obligations don't have as much meaning as they need to, and you need to bind people to the fact that they're using appropriate technology formats um, and policies, and by people in this case I mean organizations. Um, I, when you look at identity issues, governance is one of the big problems that you have with that. How do you manage identity? And chances are we're going to have multiple identities depending on the purpose we're using them for. Because we may or may not wish to externalize some information depending on what the context of the transaction or the parties that we're engaging with. And when you look at the governance of those issues, consumers, an identity is made up of more than just your name. It's also made up of a number of attributes that are associated with that name, because that's one of the things that helps create the context across that identity. And that is usually one of the things that is being controlled. Now, the name itself may also be controlled in a pseudonymous or anonymous application, and that's something that technology is working on as well. On the other side of the identity, you have the people who are credentialing or, or validating identity, because often as you go into a transaction, there needs to be some validation of identity if payment is involved or other issues are involved. So you have both consumers who have attributes over which they need control. You have other entities that are doing credentialing. Some of them may be governmental entities if they're uh, credentialing a driver's license or a passport or some other item, uh, because un those are also used as some of the identity documents that we use to establish identity in transactions. One of the things that the Liberty Alliance has done, uh, which uh, Oracle was also helped create and turned over to the, Liber to the Liberty Alliance, was what we like to call our IGF, uh, which was the Identity Governance Framework. Not obviously to be confused with the IGF we're at at the moment. Um, and the Identity Governance Framework really was a management system to look at both the source side and the consumer side by developing specific markup languages that would help 
create some of those control parameters, help create validation protocols, and be a way of doing some of these controls at the technological level, having them also supported at the policy and legal level below them. Uh, it's one of the ways of looking at user centricity in an ecosystem by creating a governance framework related to how these various actors interact and the types of information they exchange. When looking at the user-centric and federated models in this sense and looking at the e-portfolios that Task 3 is coming up with, there were a number of issues that both of those systems were looking at as important hallmarks that had to be achieved. The concepts of data minimization, least means access or the idea that you use the least information possible to satisfy the, the legitimate needs of the requester, uh, a need to know so that not everybody in the requester's organization gets access merely because they're part of the organization, User control, which is in some way an evolution of the consent model to be an ecosystem concept. How do you have control over some of the disclosures and rights that you're doing? And lastly, an accountability framework. Because in all of this, there has, trust will only be engendered if there is a framework across which accountability will flow. So that's another thing that's looking, that's being used. And this is a very important factor because what we're looking at, is, especially in the portfolio concept, is portfolios that last a lot longer than a transaction. Your health, your health record and your employment record are obviously multi-year things that have not one distinct life cycles, but many life cycles, but they are all inherent in the archive of that record in one way or another. Uh, and having choice in what is externalized versus understanding what public policy needs are for, for instance, medical treatment, those are the kinds of things that are some of the tension issues that occur when you have these long-lived records. As we look at these records, we want to take a look at some of the new tools as well as some of the issues that are raised inherent in them. In terms of the new tools, some of these control languages create the concept of sticky policies. These are actually policies that flow with the information so that you're associating controls with the information. Now, exactly how those policies work and the ontologies and the nomenclature there are lots of, if you go to both the Liberty Alliance and Task 3, you'll find links to how they describe those things, so I, and I don't really have time to go into them. You have the concept of reputation engines. Today, the, perhaps the most successful use of the reputation engine is on eBay, where people are able to rate the quality of uh, people who are power sellers and sellers to say that you know, they're trustworthy or not trustworthy. But over time, more and more types of reputation engines will exist and those will be used by both the portfolios as well as the identity management services. We have the concept of cloud computing which is coming on and companies like Amazon which are offering very, very inexpensive access to computing power so that people who have some broadband access in developing countries can actually get the use of very large processing at very beneficial pricing uh, and that's part of the E2 cloud uh, for uh, Amazon. Virtual worlds, uh, one of the things that never had occurred to me but was written up in a Time Magazine article a while back was uh, the ability of virtual worlds to help people who have uh, either limitations on their ability to socially interact or physical limitations that don't allow them to move as freely as they would and how virtual worlds can actually have a freeing effect and a, uh, a beneficial effect on those people as well as the fact of virtual worlds having impact on some of the ICT issues but identities in virtual worlds um, become an issue that were raised in some of the initial points on how your avatar looks. Uh, and unfortunately, <coughs> avatars are things you can choose how they look. And uh, I think the comment was a reflection of society on how images have been built into us that we choose to look in a certain way when we have an option of how to change our looks. Uh, I've always wondered when they took my ID picture here, I asked them if they could add hair and take off weight. Uh, they told me they couldn't. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is things like user-generated content. Because user-generated content, and there are a number of places where this is already happening, uh, some of the companies like Google and other places have mashups where users can create applications, users can also post content. This is kind of a dynamic and flowing situation, and in, in some ways it's also part of a larger creative commons. We can get into open source and non-open source and some of the licensing models and whether there should be restrictions on content and how some of those things have to be accounted for in financing and other things. But the, the concept of user-generated content is actually interesting because it's also putting a different dynamic between people. 
So as you capture other people in your content and you publish it yourself, what responsibilities do you undertake? Do you undertake the same responsibilities as an organization that would publish that content when you're an individual publishing that content? So these are some of the issues um, that we'll have to come to terms with. And I guess the last, which will be kind of the responsive comment, I think you know, one of the questions you have to look at fundamentally when you, when you approach the system is, do you want to be empowered with tools to make decisions for yourself and to take certain actions and to determine certain parameters, or do you want that done by the system or by a government? And depending on how you come out with that question, you will have a different point of view as to how much someone hardwires your choices before you get there. That does not in any way preclude the conversation that if I'm going to give you tools to protect yourself, whether it's virus checking or personal protection tools or personally enhanced, privacy enhancing technologies, that they have to be provided to you in a way that you understand how they work, you understand what they do, and they're easy to use. Those are kind of baseline requirements for any of these tools, otherwise they really don't work. So the concept of the fact that we can do a better job articulating what the tools do, describing how they work, and making the controls more user intuitive, that's something that will be an ever increasing curve of, that has to be done. But the question, there's a basic foundation question of whether and who should be the decision maker. The last question I'll say is, when you look at issues, you can't sit there and start with the assumption that, well, what I'm going to do is re-architect the entire service so that it actually does exactly what I think I want it to do. Part of the concept of some of these services is they exist to serve certain purposes, and those purposes will not serve all people. And if you are an outlier to the purpose of that service, for instance, if you want to post web pages but you don't want anyone to see them, then a social networking engine is really not something that's of great benefit to you. And someone shouldn't consider that that social networking engine is going to re-architect itself to serve the person who doesn't want to use it. So I think what you're going to have to figure out is, part of the question is, how do you work within the context of the service that is offered to actually make it appropriate, to make it better, to make it transparent, to make it accountable? Those are all legitimate aspects. Re-architecting the service to actually do something that it was never meant to do is actually part of the problem that we sometimes see in these discussions. And with that, I'll turn it back to our moderator. Um, I guess one of the problems that we have and that I've noticed here is that that piece of the jigsaw puzzle about technology is fairly ununderstandable to, uh, uh, to most people. Um, but anyway, we'll uh, discuss that, and then uh, uh, the issue of, of, of validation of data and so on, and uh, and what that means. It'd be interesting to find out or to talk about where those validations organisations are, interoperability and so on, roles for the private and public sector as well, perhaps, and uh, then some warnings about uh, we can't re-architect the internet, and uh, actually we don't want to, do we? We just want a social network that does good things and no harm. Do you have any burning questions at the moment or uh, to, to ask now or, or, or we can take some more presentations? So uh, <coughs> what do you think? Please, just take a couple of questions now to break the, f break the, uh, <laughs> break the flow of things. And uh, if, if you'd like to give this gentleman a microphone, if you'd like to tell us who you are, because it's being recorded and posterity would like to know. Uh, thank you. I am Gihan Dyer. Very, very few people, few people really understand how these things work. So if you let them do it themselves, they are very likely to do something which is not really what they intended. Would you like to comment on that? I think you're absolutely right. The mist comes up. To choose whether or not you would like to secure the communication on which you send your password and your financial information. So some of these issues, especially where there is a high level of complexity, are clearly things that need to be done at the infrastructure level. Now, I think there are other things where you have options. What kind of, and, and the options need to be presented to you in a way that is user friendly. But what websites you go to see, you know, you might end up getting websites that could conceivably have some kind of a scam on them. 
but is there a way to control that? Clearly, a website that is engaged in illegal activity should be closed down by the government. But there also has to be some choice that you can exercise over which ones there are. If you go to a social networking site, for instance, do you choose to share or not to share some of the information you post? That's a decision that you're going to have to make. That's not a decision that personally I would want the government to make for me. Now, there can be a discussion as to whether the tools are usable, whether the tools are transparent, and whether you've been given enough information. I, I think the other thing that we have to be concerned about, and I think this is where your point really will become even more relevant over time, as technology increases in complexity, and it is less, it is less likely that you will understand everything that is going on in a transaction beyond the point of contact you have, there have to be some norms that are associated with that contact and there has to be some way in which you are given information in a way that's understandable that allows you to exert some of those controls. The e-portfolio systems are, I think, an interesting way of looking at that because you have a number of those controls where you get to determine some of the sharing. And one of the things that, for instance, Task 3 is working on is having the usability of the interface tested so that people actually understand what's being provided to them as options. But I think the, the point you make is exactly right. The question we have is where you draw the balance and where you can give options for control versus where some things need to be built into the infrastructure. But I suppose a little part of me is really still wondering if uh, you know, um, choosing the right options for identity management is going to be beyond Joe's six pack, but we'll think about that. Uh, one more question before we go to our next presentation, ladies and gentlemen, or please, the gentleman in a blue top. Could you His persona to be online versus what he really is. Um, do you think government has any role or, uh, um, or isn't it a the lapse on privacy if we start identifying people uh, more accurately online? Because the choice of what my digital persona is versus what I am, I think it's best left to the individual, not to the government. I, I, I would agree with you. I think the role that government can play, I'll give you an example from the Unifier for Social Insurance, but it's an identifier unique to a person and it's actually one of the things that can facilitate identity theft. A number of states and in fact the federal government has moved to the fact that you should not use a social security number as an identifier. The beneficial thing is they don't tell you what an identifier should be, they, they leave that to the flexibility of technology, but they find where there are places where there are significant abuses like on ID theft related to social security numbers, they suggest that. Another example is the Italian Data Protection Commissioner has decided that an eight-digit alphanumeric passcode is what should be appropriate for security. And now, I'm not sure that level of detail in legislation is necessarily appropriate because things change over time and it, over time we may determine that passphrases are more useful than, than passwords, but those are examples where some governments have taken account of how you do things and certain things related to identity. Uh, I do think there are things that government can do to promote good practice just like there are things that industry associations are doing to promote good practice. And I'll mention the Data Security Council of India, uh, which has been set up by NASCOM, which is looking at developing some of these best practices. The International Chamber of Commerce works to develop a number of these best practices, and businesses work together. And more and more, we are now working in community with stakeholders like government and civil society as we develop these. And so I think the IGF is a forum where these discussions are also very useful because it's multi-stakeholder by definition as well. Okay, just a final, uh, uh, Thomas, you, you spoke earlier and uh, on behalf of the Council of Europe colleagues, um, does the Swiss government think leaving things to the individual is always the best thing to do? Um, thank you. <clears throat> uh, it depends, uh, I, I would say. Um, and um, of course, uh, there is something about the argument that if people want a service which is about revealing personal information, it's no use changing this service into something which is the opposite. But the question is, uh, <clears throat> in our view, is like we, we try to build on empowering people. We try to build on, on people are able to protect themselves. And, and we, 
in the hope also that, uh, like, like it's been told, the industry helps in empowering people by making, creating tools and services that are understandable and, and so on. The problem is what do we do with the vulnerable people of society? Those that are, do not live in an environment where they have the opportunities to be able to protect themselves. And with regard, uh, uh, and there, in, in, uh, in Switzerland, we have the obli obligation to protect those people in one way or another. The question is how to best protect them, whether it's a law or whether you try to engage with, with the industry and, and, and civil society and so on. There are different, there are different remedies. But just to, to maybe uh, give back a provocative sta statement, when you say um, you, sh you should not, you should not uh, uh, prevent people of, by making laws that prevent them from doing what they want. If you take the car traffic, especially in the US, probably at least in Europe, most people would like to drive faster than they're allowed to by the law, but they would still go for a law that prohibits, uh, that, that introduces a speed limit even uh, uh, because it, 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 it helps to, 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 uh, to uh, minimize the, the, the number of people killed in car accidents. Even if when they are sitting in the car at the very moment and they are late, uh, they would like to drive faster, but they still kind of accept the fact that there is a law that protects themselves from themselves or from the behavior of others. So, uh, there's, uh, uh, and if you are a government, if there is no if there is no protection for the vulnerable people, and if you have to somehow uh, obey to the will of the people, there will be, and we have that in Europe at the moment, we have lots of cases that are in the media of people who, who committed suicide or have, these are the extreme cases, but we have lots of, every week you can read about bullying and, and, and cyber uh, harassment of, of young uh, uh, people, especially girls. and, and there are tendencies that people and then politicians uh, ask for uh, uh, laws that prohibit these kind of services or prohibit that or prohibit that. And of course, the lawmakers have to respond to that. And, and probably just prohibit things is not, is not the most intelligent thing to do. But, uh, and that's why we also would say it's necessary that we create a, an environment of trust between the industry and the users in order to try to avoid laws that are not useful for the purpose that, that they should be. But in the end, if, if there is nothing working, you have to end up coming up with a law and then see whether this is working. And probably the solution is a combination of all those tools. Thank you. Okay, let's move on then to our next, uh, well, the rest of our panelists, beginning with Ceren Yunol, who is a lawyer from Turkey and who's going to uh, give you some insights into the legal perspectives. Ceren. Uh, the in through the internet, through social networking sites, through blogging sites, uh, through news groups, forums, even search engines and sites offering e-commerce services. This internet enables us to express so many dimensions of our identity, our social identity, cultural, political, economic, physical, mental. So the information revealed regarding these multiple identities clearly falls within the definition of personal data, which makes data protection significantly important when it comes to online ID management. Uh, in order to protect personal data, the main principle is fair and lawful processing, which is only possible by the consent of the data subject, which is the individual in concern. This consent is actually a qualified one, which should be explicit, which should be freely given, specific as to the purposes of processing, and most importantly, an informed one. This consent is practically uh, given in our everyday life by simply clicking a box next to the words, I agree. Here we have an important question, if the person who is clicking the box is actually a minor, can we say that the criteria for disqualified consent is met? This is worth discussing. Again, a very important issue, particularly regarding social networking sites is that a special form of data, sensitive data, which is related to the information on race, ethnic origin, political opinion, religious, philosophical beliefs, health or sex life of the individual is widely available. Of course, sensitive data is even more sensitive when it comes to minors for children and teenagers who are really eager to put themselves out there online without being so cautious. 
which make them even more vulnerable to the new forms of cyber threats, namely cyberbullying, cyberstalking, and all other forms of harassment online. Also, social networking sites are being used as uh, for predators to actually meet with the victims in the real world. Cyberbullying has also some serious offline consequences which may lead the minor to quit school and take homeschooling or even commit suicide. You might probably remember the MySpace case which resulted in the suicide of, the, of a 13-year-old girl in the States. Fake profiles, identity theft are also used as tools. You may again remember the famous cartoon in the New Yorker years ago, which is still, I think, applicable on the internet. Nobody knows you're a dog. This cartoon was, I think, this is still applicable today. Another important issue worth addressing is also log privacy, particularly for search engines, as logs can be surprisingly revealing uh, some aspects of identity. So these issues and many more which I cannot address right now due to time limitations cannot be solved merely by providing legal rules and sanctions. Appropriate and carefully designed, carefully drafted contractual provisions uh, in user agreements is also crucial. And even more important, I think industry self-regulation to determine the technical standards of privacy and data protection will also serve as effective means, since these standards will be more sector-specific, more technology-proof and flexible compared to imposing purely technical legal provisions. Uh, with regard to the protection of minors, I should say uh, still a huge responsibility remains to be on the parents, which should not be underestimated. In the end, whatever regulation is to be made, freedom of expression should not be compromised as a priority, and the measures taken should be proportionate and compatible with the democratic society. This is particularly important in today's world with regard to the data mining and data retention activities conducted by governments, and the appropriate legal remedies for any kind of abuse should be available at all times. I think uh, the whole question is whether we should take a preventive or a punitive approach. I think preventive. I think we should focus on appropriate use rather than prohibition. Uh, I'm not a fan of the code as code approach. I think some regulation is necessary, but I think uh, the right of the individuals to self-determination regarding personal information is crucial and should not be compromised. Thank you. Thank you. So we heard then about um, lots of words that are uh, notoriously difficult to pin down, didn't we? Fair and legal consent and so on. Uh, and the issues of social uh, networking information. Um, the teenagers who actually, uh, how should I say, actually, actually want to put their information uh, out there because as part of the process of finding their own identity. So in a minute, we'll go on to have the case study of Korea, but I just see Marco Pancini here in the audience, and I wondered, uh, because he was going to say a few words about the issues of identity and, and search engines. He's from Google, uh, and so get ready to throw your rotten tomatoes. Marco. Hi, Marco Pancini from Google Italy. Thank you very much uh, for, for this great opportunity for us to reinforce the message about our commitment uh, for child protection. Um, the problem of the identity management online is extremely difficult to, to identify, actually, because uh, we, are, we are working in, in an environment where we need to find the right balance between privacy and child protection. Because when, when we talk about identify a minors online, we talk about trying to find a way to really know who is on the other uh, side of the screen. And so get uh, as much information as we can, uh, also through technical measure in order to, to, to uh, really uh, ascertain his uh, is, uh, is age uh, so uh, let him allow to go online. This, this creates a lot of problems from a privacy standpoint especially if we go uh, through an environment where we, we as a search engine or social networking, we are required to collect no information at all or as, as little information as we can 
the right balance between these uh, and uh, the need of identifying the minors uh, is, uh, is extremely hard to, 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 um, to find a solution. Then I would like to, to, to stress three points, which are the main pillars of our strategy when we, we go uh, to child protection. Uh, we think that we need to provide, uh, as, as, industry, uh, as, as industry leaders, a meaningful tool uh, to families, uh, to parents, to schools, uh, to, to use the internet tools in, uh, in the internet service in, uh, in a safe way. For example, we, are developing, we have de developed the safe search uh, tool, which allows a family, the families to control what kind of content their children access when they are online. It's very easy to use. It's, uh, quite intuitive uh, for, for the families. We are trying also to increase the, the knowledge of this tool through various systems like an online uh, uh, safety, uh, ch child safety uh, section of our site that we are going to build, uh, the uh, booklet that we released and we are um, giving out uh, through also uh, ONGs working with us on, 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 this, uh, on, this, uh, on this field. Uh, in terms of privacy, we are developing also some, some new tools to provide more knowledge about our privacy policies. For example, we are moving to a structure of our, our privacy policies, which is no more this long text that you have to, to, to accept and click uh, at the end of the registration process. But we are, for example, experimenting videos. Uh, videos with the subtitles in various languages in order to really have somebody, some physical person, explain to the user what kind of data we collect, what we do with, with their data. But then I think that we cannot forget the two important pillars of the child protection, education and prevention and reaction also. Uh, education, uh, we are working a lot uh, in, the, in this field through uh, an important project like Teach Today uh, in Europe in order to provide tools to the teachers uh, uh, on how to, to, to uh, teach to, their, to, their, to the schoolers how to, to use uh, the internet tools in a safe way. Another important project in, in, uh, in this field is a project that we are developing, for example, in Italy with uh, the Minister of Public Education. Uh, the Minister of Public Education is going to use uh, YouTube to communicate directly to the, to the schoolers and use uh, YouTube to provide also videos and information about cyberbullying uh, with the testimonial in order to, to, to let the people understand that, that this kind of things is not cool, it's, uh, it's stupid. Uh, but then, uh, for sure, the, the um, the collaboration with law enforcement in the prevention and in the fight against, uh, against uh, child pornography and uh, all the legal activities in relation to child protection is, is, a, is a something that we cannot forget and we are very committed in this. We had few, few problems in the past, we, we are recognizing we are a very young company, but we are learning by mistake how to deal with, uh, with law enforcement, with um, public prosecutor and we are achieving incredible goals. There was a section just on this stage a few days ago where we spoke about the, the, the good results that we achieved in Brazil thanks to this kind of approach. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Very young company, very rich company. Uh, anyway, you heard about meaningful tools and uh, uh, the safe search, collaboration uh, with uh, other agencies. Now we have three more sh uh, short uh, statements and first of all uh, one about the case, uh, a case study of what's happened in Korea. This is really fantastic I think. Uh, and then uh, uh, Janice Richardson will tell us uh, about um, her, her books and then we'll have a, a one about mediation mechanisms. But first of all, uh, Sun Yong Yang, if you'd be kind enough to tell us about what happens in Korea. expression and image align from the perspectives of autonomous regulations and cultures of user communities. Let me begin with Marshall Manuel's famous statement, the medium is the message. As Manuel said, it is not the matter of our intentional decision how we will identify ourselves. The birth of the printing technology resulted in the emergence of a modern man and the new structure of a modern society, not intentionally but unavoidably. This paper can be a good example because it created the imagined community named Nation State by combining people from various regions who had never met each other before. 
We have seen the huge impacts of nationalism for several hundred years, and those impacts have not always been positive. And now we are living in the information society. The more multimedia and new technologies are developed, the more the formation of identity comes to rely on multimedia products. The internet makes us connected to the rest of the world for 24 hours. The digital camera and camcorder push people to express themselves in more visualized forms. Here is my first argument. We cannot avoid these changes used caused by new media. In addition, the internet has changed our life into a better way in spite of its negative side effect. Then I guess the question sh should be raised is how we can keep the internet as a good thing by figuring out the negative effects. My answer to this question, which is my main argument today, is that we should be patient with the process of trial and error of this new and young medium, and pay more attention to how internet users themselves figure out those errors, because users are wise and experimental enough. And I don't think this process is slow at all, considering the short history of the internet. I will show you how individual internet users manage their identity for themselves on the community level through two websites of South Korea. This is one of the most popular social networking websites called SciWorld. You must know about MySpace or Facebook. SciWorld is a sort of a forerunner of those social networking websites which enable users to express themselves in the forms of multimedia. So, SciWorld mini homepage became very popular over the whole nation because it enables people to express themselves in the forms of storytelling. You can express yourself not only through the, the, the avatar, but also through the background music and image, mini room, and also your photo with the story. In the early days of SciWorld, Users of this website were quite open to anonymous or strange visitors since it was very exciting experiences to reveal themselves and be responded by others. However, the responses from others were not always pleasant. Someone can stalk you and violate your private life. Learning from their own experiences, users of SciWorld came to manage and secure their identity and private life by certifying who can read the contents in their mini homepage for themselves and adjusting the level of revealing their private life. This type of managing method is possible when users subscribe for a certain website or a service and know each other. Then how about the situation? People don't know each other and subscription is non-mandatory. The other website shows how users manage their identity in the anonymous situation on the net. This website called This Inside is famous. It's creative and interesting user created content like this. This website does not ask users to subscribe for their website. Users can use any nicknames when they unload something to this website and reply to others. Also, they can change their nicknames anytime, which means identity theft can easily happen. But the problem is not serious because the formation of identity on the internet is determined by what, what a given person has been doing rather than what this person looks like. Even though you can steal other person's uh, name, you cannot steal their identities because identity should be approved within a certain community to be identity, because identity is a social construction. One of the interesting culture of this website is that if someone keeps inserting other users, the other users do not respond to but ignore this user because they know because the other users know that inserting is a distorted expression to be paid attention to by others. No response is a sort of consented collective action in this website. I think it's a hilarious reverse of cyberbullying. 
In addition, users of this, we this website are very careful to reveal their identities such as uh, photos and telephone numbers because this website is based on anonymous users. But the users of, of this website do not complain of the possibility of uh, anonymous uh, violence because they know that they can also benefit from the anonymity by being freer to express their thoughts. They just need to be more careful to enjoy the freedom of expression based on anonymity and actually they manage it quite well. Here are my conclusion remarks. Identity is a social construction. Reputation within a certain community can be a sort of community approval system. And reputation and autonomous regulations within user community can be a good method to manage one's identity on the net. I do not mean that autonom autonomy can solve all the problems related to identity management. However, I want to emphasize the importance of user community and their autonomy to manage the online identity. It is the very foundation from which we should start to think about identity management. Thank you. So that, uh, that concept, uh, of course, well, it's more than a concept, the social construction, of course that's what it is, and uh, a user community and cultural registration as, as a foundation for identity management, of course. Is that enough? Is that all we have to do? Uh, let's turn to, uh, to Janice Richardson, who's going to tell us about the tools that have been developed in the Council of Europe. Janice. Um, we've been talking about identity, the, the right to choose, to have options, self-determination, social construction. But if we analyze all of these terms, why since? And this handbook, which, as I said, addresses teachers and parents, uh, is broken up into a number of sections and deals with 25 themes in all. We can break these themes down into two different types. On the one hand, we have the tools, and it very clearly explains what are the tools, mobile phones, for example, what they can do, what our human rights are when using these tools, how our human rights can be infringed, the things that we should be looking at, but also what is the value added in education of these tools. It provides also facts, uh, how many users use a mobile phone, how much this is increasing, what new possibilities you have with it, but it also gives examples of best practice, web links, ways that you can use this in the classroom to develop better knowledge and give young users all that they need to become autonomous because autonomy is not born. It needs to be nurtured. The fact sheets also are broken down, broken down into rights. So on the one hand, we have the tools. On the other hand, we have rights. And we have full chapters dedicated to the concept of the right of privacy, democracy, active participation, uh, copyright, being creative. So from the basis of this and from the use that these fact sheets in the, in the Internet Literacy Handbook have been receiving and the fact that already it's been translated into some dozen languages, the, European, uh, the Council of Europe decided just two years ago that it should go one step further. Now it has developed a game called Through the Wild Web Woods. You can find this on wildwebwoods.org, which puts all of the information contained in the Internet li Literacy Handbook into a game, an online game, that young children up to the age of 12 can play. Already the game has also been translated into eight or nine languages. I think it's very important to point this out because the game in itself looks at the concept of identity, lets the, the young user choose his identity, experiment with identity in a safe environment when he can learn 
what options are available, how he can control identity, and which option is the right one at the right moment. It's all I'm going to say about these two tools, but I think that it's most important to go and have a look at them for yourself. So the Internet Literacy Handbook and the Wild Web Woods online game. Webwoods.org. Um, I guess I wonder if the uh, fathers and mothers of the digital generation uh, could use a, a game or two as well. Um, that issue of uh, internet literacy is, a, is an interesting one, isn't it? Because uh, in days gone by, you could argue that the uh, mediation between, <laughs> uh, between the knowledge uh, and the, uh, the learner, if you will, was partly provided by uh, educational institutions. Uh, and um, have we lost something as well as gained something? So our, our final uh, panelist this morning uh, Dr. Krishna Reddy is going to tell us something about uh, mediation uh, mechanisms. Please. Sorry. Yes, sir. Uh.